So titrating the propofol with this EMG spike really facilitates the surfing of the level of consciousness and it makes your MAC case really look like a general anesthetic and we all know how fond everybody is of general anesthesia. Now, if you see patient movement in this area here, you see a nice level biz trace and you don't see any activity of the frontalis muscle. There's no spinal cord reflex that can activate the frontalis muscle. So now we're not in the situation where the surgeon looks up and says, gee, Barry, the patient's light. You say, well, the patient's right here and there's no frontalis activity. Treatment for this is more local and some more propofol to make sure they stay in that range. So the main reason general anesthesia gained favor over sedation cases was the constant back and forth argument when the patient would move during sedation, the surgeon's irritated, he wants more anesthetic, the, the anesthesiologist said to you, would you just put some more local in? And the problem is that the blanched field from your epinephrine is only showing you that. You've got epinephrine effect in 98%, but that one little nerve fiber that you twinged is the problem. 99% of the patient movement is resolved by two cents worth of lidocaine in the immediate area that you're done, and the patient does much, much better. People say, well, geez, I'm not that good with local anesthesia. I didn't train in South America where we didn't have, and we had to do open gallbladders with local anesthesia. They say, look, I'm not asking for perfection. I'm only asking for you to persist. Without this brain monitor, you can't tell the difference between movement that generates from the spinal cord versus movement that comes from the head. So in the days before 1996, we sort of had to shotgun everything because we didn't know if that movement signified awareness and recall. So now that you have that technology since 1996, it's been validated in over 3,000 scientific studies, it's more the issue that the company can't tell the anesthesiologist to set the trend up for EMG because it's not FDA approved. So they're in a bond. But then there's people like me who don't take money from the company who have no issue. It's much like advocating the use of Botox for wrinkles before they before you <coughs> set the FDA approved. Isn't it? At any rate, so when you have the monitor, you're able to maintain the propofol between 60 and 75 and imitate general anesthesia. The implications are when you have this numerical device, you have a reproducible level of propofol below which you can give the ketamine without the historic negative side effects that all of you know, all of you have heard stories or seen stories yourself, the hallucinations, the hypertension, the tachycardia. I'll remind you my first publication was in plastic and reconstructive surgery, 1993. It said, hypnosis from propofol blocks ketamine-induced hallucinations. So the tip is, when you have the device, which I didn't have for the first five years I did the technique, you never give the ketamine a biz above 75. You induce the propofol gradually, so you create a steady level of propofol in the brain, and you, you can't get that if you bolus the propofol like most of us in anesthesia are trained to do. More implications. When you dissociate a patient, you eliminate the initial pain of injection. And my friends, this is why people who inject local anesthesia under general still have post-op analgesia issues because the pain signal gets to the brain under general anesthesia but the brain's just too stupefied to do anything with it until it wakes up in the recovery room and says, hey, hey, who was hurting me while I was asleep? I don't like that. So this dissociation effect is an all or none thing. You have to saturate all of those receptors but they're in the midbrain. And the problem is that the midbrain doesn't really vary much in size in adults and so what I discovered over the years is that 100 pound women and 250 pound men would lay perfectly still with the same 50 milligram dose of ketamine. So I said, well, I know this is heresy, but it appears that there doesn't seem to be any effect of body weight with the ketamine dose. If you wait two to three minutes after you inject the ketamine for two circulation times, patients will lie still and let you do what you need to do. More of the implications. Association blocks that initial pain of injection. As soon as you send that initial pain signal to the brain, you've lost the game. Or as my good friend Guido says, as soon as you hurt the patient, it's over. I said, right. And what our friend Dr. Apfel says, as long as you're giving emetogenic agents, which are stinky gases and narcotics, giving anti-nausea medicine is of limited utility. This is from a man who makes his living evaluating anti-nausea medications for companies. Now, ketamine is very important, and I want to validate every lousy experience that any of you have ever seen or heard of with ketamine. But as Mark Twain said, it's very, very important not to let your schooling interfere with your education. Okay, enough of that. That's 
the wake up call. So the more implications are that if you use biz with EMG for titrating your propofol, it will make your MAC case look like a general anesthetic. If you respond to EMG spikes, you've now created a, a video game in each patient. And uh, question? And maintaining the biz in this range of 60 to 75 really simulates general anesthesia. This will predict patient movement, unlike if you trend biz solely, because biz is delayed 15 to 30 seconds behind real time. What this does is provide you a logical basis for the treatment of patient movement. If you see the biz is at 60 to 75 and the patient moves, you already know what the, the diagnosis is. I just need some more local. And for the first five years I did this technique, even my regular surgeons, I could not convince them because they're looking at the vasoconstricted field and said, what do you want from my life? It's, I got epinephrine effectives in the same syringe? You gotta be crazy. They don't say that anymore. We don't have to fight about what the best maneuver is to take care of the patient. And so this takes the stage for a win-win-win. The patient wins primarily because now you didn't hurt him during the case as well as not hurting him injecting initially. The surgeon wins because you don't have to listen to the patient moaning and groaning about how much pain they're in postoperatively or being sick to their stomach from the drugs that your anesthesiologists give. And the PACU uh, personnel as well as the family that takes care of the patient are delighted because the patients don't even look like they've had surgery. So when you give more local when it's indicated, you don't hurt the patient during the case. And so now you're going to be able to predict, prevent, and properly treat patient movement, again, imitating general anesthesia. This is just a summary slide of what we just talked about. This is the big slide. Everybody has their pen handy? When I was here last month, I said, look, this is a little tidbit that you should all write down. .med.com slash listing sex slash 631327. You too can get a monochrome monitor used for $500. And I have to tell you, for $500, you'd have to be really hard pressed not to have the advantage of this technology for your patients. So the message is very simple don't hurt the patient on the table, and you don't have any problems after surgery. The outcome of this well, I've used no narcotics on my patients since 1998. Okay? My patients take Tylenol, maybe Toradol. Sometimes I talk too much, so I try to reduce the, the message to the bare minimum. And I often say, well, if an anesthetic that's cheaper, simpler, safer, and better isn't good enough, I don't know what it is that you're looking for to make your outpatient surgery as safe as possible. Again, I'll remind you to measure the brain, to preempt the pain, and emetic drugs abstain. This is the little girl that started it all. This is Goldie, and you can only imagine the things that come up on a Google search for blonde haired doll, but this is one I finally did find. And then upcoming publications this year, those of you who've already seen the January issue of the White Journal know that there's an article in there uh, called Anesthesia and Cosmetic Surgery, which actually has two of my papers referenced in it, uh, but they didn't uh, have me write a discussion for the article, but they are going to publish my letter to the editor. Those of you who know a little bit about ketamine know that the code word for the use of ketamine is the word dissociation. So I played on that for the title of the letter. And I said, anesthesia and cosmetic surgery article was dissociated from Sutton's Law. Now that you know what Sutton's Law is. Uh, they're also publishing a My Opinion piece on what is general anesthesia this coming April. And uh, those of you who know uh, Bob Strauch and, uh, and Charlie Herman know that they have an encyclopedia of massive weight loss surgery that I have the chapter in anesthesia for post-bariatric surgery. So questions, comments? You can get chapter one for free. I have six copies of my book for people who want an autographed copy, but you can get it cheaper on the internet. <laughs> Thank you very much.